I'm coming to you this evening to share with you a little bit about my journey. Not my journey as a researcher, not my journey as someone who cares deeply about technology, not my journey as a wife or a sister or any of that, but I'm coming to you to share with you my most important journey, and that is my journey as a teacher. So these are a few of my students that um, have learned alongside me, and I mean that truly because every day they teach me something different um, for the better part of the last decade. And sometimes my students look like this, and sometimes my students look like grown-ups, and sometimes my students are the engineers at the technology company where I work, um, and they are by far my most difficult class. Uh, so what I would ask of you is how many teachers are here. How many people are teachers? Thank you. I know you put in a really hard day at school today, and I know how tired you all are, so thank you for taking the time to come out this evening. Um, how many folks are administrators or principals? Folks who work um, in schools or run schools, a couple folks, and then maybe other people who just wandered in here by accident, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to get out of the rain, perhaps. So what I'm really here to do today is to share with you what my students taught me about learning and then how I used that to create an environment um, that I think has been really transformative to my development as an educator. And all of this starts with sort of this fundamental understanding that learning is very, very social, especially for adults. That when we are learning, we learn best when we're learning with other people, and we learn best when we decide and we choose what it is that we want to learn. And so to kick us off this evening, I wanted to start with not an answer, but a question. I wanted to start with the simple question of what was your best learning experience this year? And I want you to think about that for a moment. It may have been in school, it may have been at a professional development session, but it may not have been. And when I think about my three best learning experiences this year, I actually think of things that feel very different from traditional school. So I think about the time that I met someone in the library and they taught me how to use a new computer program that really helped me organize my calendar better. And I thought about the time that my husband convinced me to go zip lining. And I thought about the time that my neighbor finally taught me how to get those roses to bloom. And when I think about all of those learning experiences, they come down to two things. They were with people I trusted, and they were things that I chose that I wanted to learn. And that is really what social learning is all about. Something that you choose to learn with someone that you trust because they have experiences that they value. These people may not be the premier expert in the field. My neighbor is not the premier expert on growing roses. However, I trusted him. His rose bushes looked much better than mine. And it was something that he helped me get just a little bit better. So what we're here to talk about today is learning not necessarily from experts, but instead sharing expertise and that we all have expertise to share. It doesn't mean that experts don't have a place, and we'll talk about that, because I think that's very, very important. But I think that also, the more we can come together as a community of learners, as adults, we will find there to be a revolution in how we feel about our students, how we feel about our classrooms, and how we feel as educators about learning. Because professional learning should be just as social as all the learning that happens in our daily lives. So when I tackle all of these problems that face me in my life, and when I use these social learning techniques, these are the same techniques that I can use to tackle what can happen in school and what can make my classroom instruction better. But the thing that I found to be a big hurdle is that it actually looks very different, 
right? When we go to professional learning, when we go to learning about our classrooms and about our schools, it often looks like this. Um, it's something that usually we are told to go to. Uh, in my case, usually my principal or my, uh, the head of my school will say, we have a professional learning session on this day, and you're going to come, and you're going to sit in the fourth row, and you're going to listen. Um, and these habits that we have can be sort of hard to break when it comes to learning. That sometimes when we want to learn something, we expect to come in and sit down and for the person up on the stage to have the answer. But I don't have the answer. Um, all I have are the questions. Because I think that uh, the more we come together and the more we start asking these questions together, the more likely we are to find the answers. Because you all have experiences that I don't have. You know things that I don't know. And together, we are much stronger than we are alone. And so there's an expert in this field. Uh, his name is Malcolm Knowles. And he talks about andragogy. And andragogy is really about adult learning and how adults learn best. And the two main parts of that are both responsibility and relationships, and then being self-directed. So this quote here talks about developing the ability to take increasing responsibility for our lives to become increasingly self-directed. And so about seven years ago, when I started on this journey, I was doing a lot of work with some of Malcolm Knowles' understandings and some of his research. And the more I learned about this gentleman, the more frustrated I became that every time I had a professional development, it looked like that. And I started to think, how could I do this differently? How could I change? And I was in my classroom, and I will be honest with you, I felt very isolated. I felt like when I would shut that door, I would love being with the kids, but after the kids left, it was just me alone in the room trying to figure out what in the world was I going to do tomorrow to help these kids learn as much as they could in the short time that I had with them? And as I started to really think about that, a friend of mine, in, in a casual offhand comment, made a suggestion that at the time seemed incredibly crazy. They said, if you want some new teaching ideas, why don't you check out Twitter? And I said, Twitter? Isn't that where people go to explain what they had for breakfast? Isn't that where people go to post silly cat pictures? Why would I go on Twitter? And my friend said, there are teachers on Twitter. And you have to know how to follow the hashtags to find these teachers. So at the time, in 2009, there was one Twitter chat. So you can see on this map now, there are dozens in all of the states in the United States. But at the time, in 2009, there was one. And it was just called EdChat. That was the only one there was. And it was on Tuesdays at noon. So Tuesdays, I would grab my lunch out of my lunch bag, and I would hurry back to my classroom while the kids were at recess. And I would go online, and I would follow EdChat at noon for one hour. And teachers would just talk about different tools and links and ideas. And I thought, man, this is kind of neat. And not only that, all of these people are trying out these ideas in their classroom. At the same time, I'm trying them out in mine. And so we had this idea um, around uh, hatching baby chicks. So we got some baby chicks, we hatched the baby chicks, and the baby chicks had a Twitter account. And every day, the baby chicks would tweet, and we would post photos of the baby chicks doing all kinds of things at night um, from the Twitter account, and it became a little bit of a sensation. So I'm going to share uh, a short video clip here that kind of shows you in the very early days of how I was thinking about learning with Twitter and with social learning and with EdCamps and sort of with some of these tools. The youngest members of Katie Zorzi's kindergarten class at Poff Elementary School in Quakertown are not her students. They are these days old baby chicks. You better not jump, little one. They're also the most popular members of the class. I like petting them. Molly's mine, and she's very cute. When we hold them, uh, 
they don't sit down, they stand up, but the claws kind of hurt. They like tickle you a lot, it feels fuzzy. They're just basically learning about the lifestyle, life cycle of a chick. Don't be scared, Molly. These chicks aren't just teaching the kids about science. Heather, where were they? They escaped. The undisciplined creatures are actually multidisciplinary. And then they're writing um, just about them, what they're learning. So we want to write, the baby chicks are starting to grow feathers. The students use phonics and a program called Kid Writing to put their thoughts on a smart board. The baby chicks are growing feathers. But that's not all. These youngsters are also learning about the web from their web-footed friends. Well, I actually found, uh, got this idea through my Twitter account. Pops instructional specialist Kristen Swanson hooked the kids up to an online site. They feel like they are contributors to a worldwide community. They aren't afraid to press buttons or do this or do that. They just want to explore. It's awesome. Like Every morning we go on, we check the wiki, and we see what parents have posted. We're playing with some writing about them. Um, we're making pictures of them. Um. There's only one downside. I wish I could take a baby chick home. She can't take the baby chicks home, but at least they are driving home lessons for life. The chicks are cute, and I just like them. So that was a long time ago, and you can even tell when you look at some of the websites um, how primitive they were. But that was kind of what started me on my journey, to see how excited the kids got when it wasn't just me and Ms. Zorzi, who were looking at their writing. Instead, it was the whole world. And I started to think, wow, maybe there are some other things that I can start to learn, and there are some other people that I can start to connect to that will take me even further. And this gentleman, Kevin, sent me a tweet a week after he saw the video uh, that I just shared with you, and he said, you know, you seem like someone that might like this event we have called a bar camp. Why don't you come along? It's free. And I thought, well, it's free. Sounds kind of interesting. Sounds kind of fun. Sure, I'll give it a try. And at the time, I was living in Philadelphia, and it was just a few miles from my home. And when I showed up, uh, this was what I saw, and it looked like complete chaos. Now, in the past, when I had been to education conferences, People would dress very formally. Um, they would come in and everything would be kind of quiet and organized. There might be some light music playing. And this was pretty much like a mosh pit. There were people all over the place talking to each other and laughing and everyone was dressed very casually. And they were all gathered around this giant board. And what I noticed was the board was full of questions and ideas. Because the idea of this particular event wasn't that people were coming to learn the answers, but instead people were coming to ask the questions and figure out possible things that might be answers together. And so you can see people started building the session board for the actual conference, the day of the event. And as someone who is very organized and really uh, enjoys like uh, everything to sort of have their own place, this felt really scary to me. I couldn't believe that they were just going to have a conference based on post-it notes that they had come up with that morning. But as we went through the day, it really worked. And it was really exciting to see how all of these questions turned into ideas and answers and resources that I hadn't thought of or hadn't known about before. And the one thing that struck me most was a comment that one of the gentlemen in one of the sessions made, which was, the world is moving so fast that if I put in a conference proposal six months ago for this session, this particular technology didn't even exist yet. And so the idea was this could be very responsive to what was happening in these different fields at this particular time. And so I started to really get in touch with the idea that to offer value, you really just had to have expertise and good questions. You didn't necessarily have to be the leading expert in the field. Now, we were drawing on a lot of that research. We were drawing on a lot of those experts. But some of them may or may not have been in the room. But instead, because we could all share what we knew, and we could all share what we learned, and we could all say, have you seen this resource, and have you seen this resource, it became a community of learners. It became a place where everyone had something very valuable to offer, and it was so energizing. 
it made me feel like I had a thousand new friends um, to help me on my learning journey. And as someone who was previously very isolated and felt that when I closed the door to my classroom, I was left there alone, this was a completely different feeling. And so I worked with five of my friends and said, hey, this was a great conference. Why don't we do this just for teachers? Because the first one was just a general one where anyone could come. We had people from all different fields coming. And we thought, let's make one especially for teachers because teaching is really hard and there's a lot to talk about. And the people who know the most about what works with kids are the people in the classroom with kids. The people who are there every day working and figuring this out and testing and sharing with each other. And so we came up with five rules of the road for this. And these are sort of the four tenets of EdCamp, the things that we decided to try when we ran that very first EdCamp. The first was that we just wanted it to be free. We just said, you know what, we'll get a school, we'll get a place to donate some, um, some space to us, and we'll just have it be free. We don't we don't have any way to accept money. We're not going to worry about it. The main reason we made it free was because we thought it would just sort of be a hassle. So we said, free. We said, open to everyone. We, we wanted it to be for teachers, but if a parent wanted to come and learn, we let them in. Or if a board member wanted to come in and check out what we were talking about, we said, yep, come on in, because you have important experiences and perspectives too. The third was, it was vendor free. We had no one there who was trying to sell anything. A lot of times in the United States, when you go to a conference, you go into a session and someone's actually trying to sell you something instead of share what, what, you, know, what, they, what you have learned or what they have learned. And so we said, no one who's trying to sell anything. We just really want people who care about the kids. The fourth rule is probably the strangest one, and it feels the strangest. And that is that anyone who comes that day can offer a session. Because the idea is not that they are presentations with slides. The idea is that you ask a question to the group, and then you have an interactive conversation about that question. Some of the best EdCamp sessions I've ever been to were ones where I didn't know uh, anything about that particular topic, and people came together and helped me and pointed me to the right resources so I could learn. And so the idea that anyone can get up and share really changes the way that the uh, environment feels because everyone is responsible for their own learning at an ed camp. I always tell people the only person to blame for a bad day at ed camp is yourself because if you're having a really bad day, it's okay, you can just go. Um, and, and I think that that's really important, that if it's not working for you, like that's okay. It's something that I call, um, it's one item on the buffet of professional development and there are lots of items that we should be choosing, and this is just one of them, and it's certainly not uh, for everyone. And then the last, and this is really important, is the rule of two feet. Um, so I am a teacher, and this rule is probably the hardest for me because I've been taught my entire life that you don't ever get up and leave a session unless you are incredibly offended by what is happening or something is on fire or something else terrible is happening. But what the rule of two feet really says is that what you need to do is you need to go where you grow. You need to be in a session that's working for you. And if you're not in a session that's working for you, try another session. Sometimes I've been in sessions that weren't really covering things that I needed, and I ended up going out into the hallway, finding someone, sitting down with them in the hallway, and having a really relevant, really powerful conversation. And that's what the rule of two feet is all about, giving you as the learner the right to be a little bit selfish. Uh, very rarely as teachers do we get to be selfish, and if you are coming out for a day of learning, get, uh, you should be a little bit selfish and learn the things that you really need to learn so that you can have that impact on kids that you want to have. And these were the first five rules of EdCamp, and they were very loose. They were very loose when we first put them together. We had the very first ed camp in May of 2010, so not too long after I had found Twitter. Um, we had no budget, and so to get people out, we used sidewalk chalk all over the town, and we drew these every day, and we would tell people all of the information, and that was how we got people to know about our event. 
The space that we had for our event was a building that was set to be knocked down three days after the event, and they told us security stops showing up seven days before they knock it down. No one will ever know that you're in there. Um, so we had a very, very small budget. We advertised on Twitter. Um, we advertised on websites. We called into radio stations and asked them to share this information. Um, it was very much a ragtag group of folks. And to be honest, on that very first morning, we were looking at this blank schedule board, and we had no idea if anyone was going to come. It was really, really scary. And we sat, and we waited, and we waited, and we couldn't believe it, but people came. And they filled up this entire schedule board. Now, you can definitely tell that I'm an elementary teacher because it's laminated and it has sticky notes on it. Um, but you can see that this board went from being blank to being filled with the questions and ideas of 100 educators who showed up on a Saturday to spend their time and to spend their energy answering questions to help their kids. And that was the most powerful moment of my life, aside from getting married, and I have to say that because my husband is in the back. Um, <laughs> so a picture is worth a thousand words. This is what that day looked like. This is what that day looked like. You can see we had panels, and it was messy, and we had people sitting next to each other with laptops, and people sitting and sort of doing their own thing. I mean. People organized in lots of different ways that day. The learning didn't look like learning usually looks when it comes to professional development. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, a movie is probably worth a million. So I'm going to show you a few video clips from that very first ed camp in May of 2009. Ed camp is comfortable. It's motivating. Yeah, it's really cool. What does it mean in today's landscape to do good research? Ed camp is organic, participant-driven professional development. There are no keynotes, there's no set schedule, and the participants set the agenda. How many of you are teacher educators? The purpose of the workshops today are to put a bunch of really smart people together in a room and share ideas and talk. Really what we're trying to do at events like this are amplify each other's ideas and really leverage those to, to help improve what we do and that's teach kids. These are Drupal blogs, so it links to 8th grade work in 2009-2010. We're seeing a wide range of educators coming from all of these different schools within the city, counties surrounding Philadelphia, and it's leading to some really rich conversations around what's going on and where are we going in education. How can you play with this stuff in a way that kids are going to get something out of it. I love how much technology is integrated into it. We're on Twitter and you can just go and you can see what's going on not only in your own workshop but what's going on in all the other workshops at the same time. You can see it in their faces. Everybody wants to raise their hand and talk because they have so many ideas to contribute. I think the thing to keep in mind first is this is a conversation. We don't mean this to be a lecture. I see a commitment from the educators here at this conference to engage and make this a really positive experience. I'm really here to learn from everybody. That's, that's why I came to Today. Ed Camp is an effective professional development. I can take what I've learned today back to my school and use similar ideas in our own professional development. Our hope is that school districts across the nation will adopt the Ed Camp model for professional development. Ed Camp has provided opportunity for people to think and talk about their educational philosophy, attend something for nothing, and come away with great ideas. I think that's really important. So those are some uh, videos and images from the very first ed camp. Uh, oh, let that finish. There we go. This has been a True Life Media production. Okay. Um, so those are some videos from that very, very first ed camp that we later edited and added a bunch of sound to hopefully make it sound a little bit fancier. Um, and after that very first ed camp, Something happened that I didn't really expect to happen. So that night, after the ed camp was finished and we were all exhausted, we wrote a blog post. And we said, hey, we tried this thing. We put up a blank schedule board. We invited lots of educators. We asked a bunch of questions. And we had a really great day. We figured out the sessions on the morning of the, the day. 
We ran those sessions as conversations where everyone interacted and tried to answer the question as best they could. We took some notes, and here you go, world, this is what we learned. And I'll be honest, I didn't really expect anything to happen. Um, and something started to happen. So that very first year, we had eight ed camps. And we were stunned because we didn't think anybody else would actually think this was a good idea. But people started calling me and saying, hey, we want to have an ed camp in New York. Do we have to have permission to do that? And I said, you want to have an ed camp in New York? That's so cool. You don't have to ask for permission. Just go. And it started to take off. And we started, we put up a blog post that said, you don't need permission. Just go run an ed camp. And we actually ran um, what we called the blank schedule board challenge, where we actually encouraged people in their faculty meetings to put up a blank schedule board. And instead of going through all the updates for their normal faculty meeting, can you ask questions and have people just group up around the questions they want to answer and talk? And so after that first year, when we had eight, the next year we had a couple more. And we even had one in Finland, and we were pretty pumped about that. And then the next year, there were even more, and then more, and then more, and then more. And now I've lost count. Um, we have probably six or seven ed camps every Saturday in the United States across the country. And the main way that I know that they're going on is because I follow the hashtag on Twitter. So if you're interested and you're curious, what is it that people are talking about when they're at an ed camp? Check out the hashtag EdCamp, or check out the hashtag EdCampPhilly, or check out the hashtag EdCampNYC, and you'll be able to see very quickly what kinds of conversations and what kinds of questions we're asking. But the important thing I would say is that the questions we're asking might not be the questions that you have. You might have different challenges. You might have different ideas to explore, and that's okay. That's what makes this model so powerful. It's that it's customized and tailored to you. And so after we had all of these ed camps and after they started happening, I started to think, well, how could we bring these people together? Because many of these ed camps were happening just on their own, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't really know everyone who was running an ed camp. And so we started to bring together this group called the Ed Camp Foundation. And the purpose of the Ed Camp Foundation is just to help ed campers meet other ed campers. And so sometimes we'll have meetups where we bring together ed campers from different parts of the world or different countries. Um, and sometimes we have video chats and we do all different sorts of events just to bring educators together because there is no worse feeling than being an educator and closing that door and being alone. And we want to make sure that if there is an educator out there that needs that support, that there is some support there for them. Oops, there's even more. Yeah, there's a lot. And the reason that this has worked is because ed camps actually have an impact on kids. Um, I know that uh, there are a lot of different ways to improve your instruction. Absolutely, there are. Um, but for me, when I talk with another educator who is tackling the same problems that I am, that's when I get the best ideas. That's when I get the insight. That's when I get the most excited. Um, and so for me, we've seen a tremendous impact on students whose teachers are ed campers. And we're starting to study this, and we're starting to go through um, experiments where we start to see what is the impact that this has. And it's very, very early. Um, and to be frank with you, there's more data that exists than we even know where it exists yet. So we're trying to sort of bring all of that together. But one of the, the most marked things that we noticed were that there were students who saw their teachers going to ed camp, and they asked to come along. They said, we heard about this ed camp thing. We heard that you think it's pretty cool. Can we come? And so the students went to the ed camp and said, well, we're going to do this, but we're going to call it Stu Camp. And so they started Stu Camp because they said, you know, we're the kids. If we want to make school better, we want to get in on this too. 
And so now, in addition to ed camp, we have stew camps where kids come together and they talk about what they want to see in the classroom. And this idea of student voice and student choice has really ignited a lot of schools where we're starting to see stew camp take off. Um, and one of the most interesting things that we've seen, specifically in the state of Iowa, is that when students in Iowa run a stew camp, they not only run the stew camp, but they run the ed camp for the teachers. And so it's part of their, I, they are the ones who bring together the invitations and manage the operations and actually run the event. And we get the best turnout there because people really want to come and participate in this conversation with their kids. And the communities come out um, and they, they do a lot of interesting things. So they often have sessions on maker spaces and you can see them building and you can see them talking and sharing about what they want school to look like. Um, because their voice is really, really important when we start to think about this change. So I'm hopeful um, that after hearing a little bit about ed camps and hearing that you get to come in to a blank schedule board offer up any idea, any question, or any topic, and talk through those topics interactively with folks that perhaps you too will want to give this a try. Um, and so on October 18th, we're having the very first ed camp here in Barcelona. I think it will be the very first ed camp in all of Spain. Um, we have not had one in England yet, so this is definitely the first one sort of even in this region. Um, and I couldn't be more excited about it. Uh, and so spread the word. I would love to have you come out and get your insight on how you are doing learning, how you are doing teaching, how you are interacting with your kids, and also how we can make this crazy thing called Ed Camp better. Uh, because everyone always has ideas, what if we tried this or what if we did that, that continue to make the model more robust. Um, because this is something that you can bring to your schools, you can bring it to your faculty meetings. Uh, it's really a great way to get involved. So why did this idea that was really just one crazy person, AKA me, uh, that was just one person's idea, why did it turn into hundreds of events? Um, well, I don't really know, but I have three guesses. Um, the first is that we got really lucky. So when I had this idea, and when I wrote that blog post, it was May of 2010, which was the same year that Twitter blew up. And so teachers who previously didn't know how to find each other started finding each other. Teachers that didn't know um, how to connect to other people who were interested in the same topics that they were all of a sudden had this new medium. And that was probably one of the biggest factors as to why this one person with one idea to make one event turned into this um, international network of educators doing amazing things. The second reason, I think, is because there was something going on in the United States at that time, uh, a specific policy, you may be familiar with it, called No Child Left Behind. Uh, and under this particular policy, if you were a teacher, as I was, you were under some pretty strict guidelines. And it, it didn't really feel like you had a lot of choices as an educator at that time. And all we wanted was to make our own choices about what was important for learning for our kids because we knew them best and we spent every day with them. And so there was a strong need in our country at that time, specifically around moving towards innovation, moving towards new problems, and helping other people um, to see that, that we could be in control of our own learning and that we could be in control of our own destiny as educators and that we had a voice, we had a choice, and we had a say. And the third piece was that we trusted each other. We had built these relationships in these networks. And I trusted that if someone said to me, I've tried this in my classroom and it works, that it was something that was going to have a positive impact on my kids. Because around that time, I was also getting more and more technology into my classroom. And there was some research on what to do with that technology. But most of the time, we were figuring it out. I remember opening up the first Chromebook and being like, I don't even know how to use this thing. And there is no best practice research yet on how to use this thing with kids. So I'm going to just try and figure it out the best I can. And I think we've come a long way since then. But I think there are still so many new technological innovations in our classrooms where we have a lot to learn. And the research is keeping up. But a lot of it, we still have to improvise and sort of make it as we go, if you will. So a couple of things. 
I shared with you a little bit about how we are social learners uh, as humans and how we need to have agency over our learning for it to be really effective. And for me, my journey took me through Twitter to EdCamp, which now has brought me to all of you. But whether you choose to engage in EdCamps or not, there are a couple of tips that I have for you just around social learning and how to take your professional development and sort of bump it up to the next level. So the first is, don't be embarrassed to share. I used to be really embarrassed as a teacher to say, I know this, I'm good at this, because I always thought, well, there must be someone out there who's better than me. There must be someone out there who knows more than I do. But I didn't realize that I was passing up a tremendous opportunity to share my expertise and to make my expertise greater by getting feedback from others and getting f um, information about how I could shape my learning. So it's, it's very common to be embarrassed, but don't be embarrassed. You always know more than you think you do. The second one is focus on the environment not specifically the content of the professional development. So make sure that the content is flexible because you might get people in the room that want to sort of explore different avenues. And the more opportunities you can give people to explore by creating that open environment, the better it will be. Make it safe to ask questions. The content is critically important. The research is critically important. But if the environment is more open, everyone will receive that information better. The third is embrace experiments. If you try something and it doesn't work, that's just the first attempt in learning, right? So some people uh, say, oh, well, that didn't work. It must, it must not work. But instead say, that didn't work. What's one thing we could change and try it again and run a new experiment? So really think about this with an experimental mindset and just make small changes. Uh, maybe you're not going to turn your faculty meeting into an ed camp, but maybe you will just have people come up with as many questions as they can for the last 10 minutes and take some time to answer them. You can start very, very small with social learning. The, the next thing is find your tribe. If you feel isolated in your classroom, there are so many places where you can go to find people who are interested in the same things that you are, whether it be Twitter, whether it be ed camps, whether it be just the networks that this foundation is bringing together. Find people, and honestly, you've probably found many of those people because that's why you're here. That's why you're interested. That's why you came out after a really long day in the classroom to spend time learning these kinds of things. And the last thing I would say is share widely. So um, you never know what idea you share that might touch someone else. Uh, so I had no idea a year ago when I was at EdCamp SF Bay in San Francisco, sharing in a session on makerspaces, that Val was gonna walk in and say, hey, I wanna have an EdCamp in Barcelona, and can you come and can we have an EdCamp? I had no idea that was going to happen. And after I met Val, he said, oh, well, I know this person and this person and this person, and I had known them too. And it was all because we were sharing widely and because we were saying that all of us are more important than any one of us when it comes to making learning better for kids. And so I recognize that this is just one small piece of a much larger puzzle. Social learning is one small piece of school change. It's one small piece of innovation. And there needs to be a lot of other things that go into this puzzle to complete it. There needs to be strong support from our government, strong support from our researchers, strong support from our communities, strong support from our parents. Um, I think that this is a journey that we have only just started, but boy, am I glad that I have other people now on my journey instead of it just being my journey alone. And so um, thank you for taking the time to join me on this journey. I hope that uh, I'll get to meet some of you, and I hope that all of you have found just a little bit of, of value, hopefully, in hearing from me, um, and it resonates with some of you in the journey that you are on. And so I'm very grateful to spend this time with you. I know um, that it's 
important time. It's time that you could be with your families or your children, and you have chosen instead to spend it with me, and that is quite an honor. So um, if you have any questions um, or you want to think about these things differently or you just want to find out more or you just want to pose a question to me that maybe I hadn't considered, please do. Um, I hope that this is just the beginning and not the end. The biggest barrier that we face is getting people comfortable with the fact that they don't know what the day is going to be about. So people will say, well, how am I supposed to come if I don't know what the sessions are? And I would say that, that getting people to just give it a try um, is probably the hardest part. And so what we've done there is we've tried half day. So you'll come at 9, and you'll be done at 11.30, and you can go have lunch. Um, and so it's this much smaller commitment that people are willing to make. We have seen some ed camps organize around specific topics. So we do have like ed camp history, ed camp art. Um, ed camp literacy is another one. But we've found that for the first few times, it's better to keep it open just because uh, you're recruiting from a much smaller pool of folks if you make it on a specific topic. Whereas if you just keep it open, what will end up happening is people s tend to kind of organize into those groups anyway. Um, I think the conversation that was brought up about Better Camp and how do we extend that conversation is one that we are really grappling with right now. So we have people who come together for a few hours and they start these conversations, and then they actually want to work on them. And so we're trying different workshop models where people can actually just get together and work on a project that was born out of an ed camp, and we're calling them work camps. Um, but there are different ways of approaching that. We found that when you do an ed camp and there are a lot of people from your local community there, people will tend to continue to organize on different digital platforms, um, in ways that they can kind of continue to work on that. But I would say that's probably the biggest thing that we're tackling. People have all of these great ideas, and then they come up with things that they want to do, and how do we make the space for them to actually continue that work? So I'm really open to continuing that conversation. We've seen it done a couple of different ways. And I think the most powerful way is that you have sort of a, a morning sort of social block. So for example, um, at Ed Camp Philly, we'll have from about 9 to about 9.40. And that is also great because some people don't get there right on time and people can kind of come in and we usually um, will get some pastries or donuts and coffee and people will just sort of mingle and chat. And as that's happening, people will put ideas up on the board um, and we usually will get enough ideas to start the day, but people can keep adding to that throughout the day. Um, but we usually find that probably about 90% of the board is locked in place by about 940, and then we kind of know what's going to happen for the rest of the time. It takes a little bit of um, getting used to with the post-its and making sure all the post-its are up there, um, but it gets a little bit easier after you've done it once or twice for sure. I think that it's just a different way of thinking, um, and I think it's a different way of understanding the value that it that comes from just sharing different practices in the classroom and I have found that teachers are more interested in peer learning when there's something that is so brand new. So for example, maker spaces were really brand new to some of the schools that I worked in, and we didn't know what the right way to organize a maker space was. So teachers were very interested in peer learning because they were so curious about what other teachers were doing on that particular topic. And so I think that if you find an innovative topic, sometimes people will be more eager to embrace peer learning if they're a little bit nervous about it at the get-go. Do ed camps feel messy? Do they feel chaotic? They can a little bit at first. Um, and there is typically a lot of movement and there's a lot of conversations that happen. Um, and I think the number one thing that we try to do to help people with that is we actually have greeters. So we'll have folks who come in and when people enter, we say, so here's what today might look like, here's what today might feel like. Um, we also have folks who have worked or been to an ed camp before, or we kind of tell them what ed camps are to sort of model some of the rule of two feet. So, hey, um, this is a great conversation, but I'm, I'm actually really interested in this other conversation. Thanks so much, and just sort of excusing themselves. And we've found that if there are a few people who are modeling some of these behaviors, it makes it a lot easier for other people to do the same. Um, and they, it, it helps people to make sure that um, they are getting what they need. 
And one of the other things that sounds sort of uh, simple but is really important is the furniture in the room. If the furniture in the room is set up like this, people will all sit like this and expect someone to stand up there and talk. Whereas if the chairs are just in a small circle, people will sit in the small circle and talk to each other. And so we try to put as many of those small nudges in place so that it just does feel like a very casual conversation. Uh, and that does help a lot. I think that there is a very large dominant conversation about the standards and the code. And I think what, to be honest, what we see is this is um, to the side of that. This is for teachers who say, yes, we need to meet the standard code, but we're here for kids. We're not here for the code. And so what are the things that my kids need right now? And we tend to see conversations about um, different books. So right now there's been a big uh, push, diversity in literature. So a lot of the literature in the United States traditionally has been not very diverse. Um, it doesn't look like the kids who are coming into our classrooms. And so we, we've had a lot of conversations about that. We've had a lot of conversations about getting kids building things and maker spaces. Um, and so I think we're saying, yes, we know that meeting those codes um, is important, but I think that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts to the point that you had raised about some of the, the bank statements. We can tally up all of the points in the system but it's, you can't tally up points and, and have that be a child. Um, and so we tend to see these conversations happening alongside those conversations, and they look somewhat different, I find. Um, to the point about, is this just a place where educators come together uh, to sort of be against the government or the code? Um, we actually don't see that at all. I, I think that people who are willing to give of their time to come to an event like this, they really want the system and everything to get better. Um, and the only way to influence things and to make them get better is to bring everyone into the conversation. And so every year in the United States, we have EdCamp US Department of Education. And it's actually held in Washington, DC um, with the policymakers. And we bring in a bunch of teachers and a bunch of policymakers. And we have both parties ask the questions and answer them together. Um, and we tr are trying to build a deeper understanding of what's happening in classrooms and connect that directly to the policymakers. And actually, just last year, uh, ed camps were actually written into the United States Educational Technology Plan as one method that teachers could use to learn from each other. So we're, we're making small strides. The first thing I would say is that uh, in many ways, some of the progressive teaching practices that are happening here are far beyond what is happening in some parts of the United States. Uh, you all work in places where uh, I would feel very lucky and privileged to work because there are some amazing things happening. Um, and I think that the unconferences here have been very popular for a very long time. And unconferences um, have only recently become popular in the United States. Uh, and for educators, the only difference between an unconference and an ed camp is that the sessions for an ed camp have to be built on the day of the event. Um, and the only reason that we put that in place was because uh, we didn't want people to make it, we wanted it to feel more informal. Um, and I think that we have a lot of work to do. We haven't been to, spread to all of the places that we'd like to. Um, we do have an ed camp in Mexico City that's actually happening next month. Um, so it's happening, it's just not happening as fast as we would like. Um, and I think that we need to do a lot more work to study the impact um, that this has on teachers and the impact that this has on students. Uh, and so it's also very hard to separate uh, is this the impact of the ed camp? Is this the impact of some other program? Is this the impact of the curriculum? Um, sometimes when you're saying, hmm, what happens to student learning, there are a lot of conflicting variables in there. And I think that we still have a lot of work to do to be really responsive in that area. And I think it's something that we would hope um, we start to see come out of this. Early findings that we have is we start to, we have started to compile all of the reflections of uh, things that teachers have implemented in their classrooms that they learned at ed camps. And we're starting to see some strong qualitative themes come out of that around student voice and student choice, um, which is something that sounds like uh, many schools here are embracing, but is also 
very, very new and very difficult for some of the places in the United States, for sure. Um, and to the point of the, the person who raised the point about the baby chicks, that was absolutely true. Um, the school that I was working at was on a farm. And so we actually got to take them to the farm um, in the back sort of after that. So we did have a very unique situation there. Uh, it was in very rural Pennsylvania. I don't know if you've ever heard of Amish country, um, but there were a bunch of Amish farms there that brought the chicks in. So yeah, we, we wouldn't, I would not be able to do that in the city, that's for sure. It would be a very different, different environment. We have two strong findings thus far, um, and I wouldn't say that either of them are causal. I think they're just related. So. Um, the first thing we find is that teachers who are involved in ed camp, who are either ed camp leaders um, or attend a lot of ed camps, tend to stay in the profession longer. So in the United States, we find that most teachers stay in the profession for about three to five years. And then they move on and they find another job. That's partially because of the wages that are provided to teachers. It's partially because, as you know, teaching is a very tough job. Um, and so by giving people the opportunity to connect with other people, they have said that they have chosen to stay in the profession longer. Now, I don't think ed camps have caused that, um, but I think that we're seeing a strong relationship between those two factors. So that is one finding that we have started to dig into around teachers and professional development. The other thing around teacher and professional development is the perceived value so um, in the United States, we have a system by which teachers have to take a certain number of hours of professional development every year to maintain their certification. And so we've done a study where we asked people, which experiences did you find most valuable? Um, and we've done that study with hundreds of educators, and uh, we always find that ed camps are either number one or number two for folks that have attended an ed camp. So that's perceived value. Now we actually need to go out and start to look at their practices in their classrooms and measure the actual value because that's just the first step. And so right now we have a new program, um, we're calling it the Ed Camp Grant Program, where people who come up with an idea for implementing uh, or changing their instruction at an ed camp um, actually write about it. If they need some materials, we provide those materials for them. Um, and then we're actually going to measure the impact that that has had on their, their classroom. Um, and we're going to see how that goes. And that's currently in progress right now. Uh, we have about another year of that study until we'll, we'll, we will know anything conclusive. Um, so uh, there's a lot more research that we have to do to be really responsible about how we use this. And I think that as far as um, administrators and ed camp, we have seen that many of them are our biggest champions uh, because they love this idea of having active learning at their faculty meetings and th other things like that. And they also love the idea of some of the teachers who might be doing great things in their classroom that other teachers don't get to see because they're in their own classrooms start to spread, not only across their school, but maybe across several schools. Um, and so we've seen them be really supportive of this model because it's something that they can do, that they can easily scale. Um, they don't need any special permission or something special. They can just decide to do this if that's something that they want to do. Uh, hi ha una pregunta més, diu, quins són, quins són els errors més freqüents en un camp que fa que no funcioni tan bé? I think the, the, there are two things that can cause ed camps to fail. One is over planning it. So I've seen people who go, I'm very afraid that no one will put anything up on the board, and so I'm going to schedule the whole board ahead of time. Um, and then it just sort of doesn't work, that it just kind of loses that excitement. Um, the second thing I've seen that, that causes ed camps to fail is when people come in and they don't know what to expect. Uh, so I think that uh, people that come in and they don't know what to expect, the more you can sort of educate them and help them feel comfortable in that first 15 minutes to half hour, will actually change the whole day and how the whole day feels. So if you can make sure that you have a lot of folks on hand to explain what's going on to new folks uh, in that first hour, it can make a big difference as to the rest of the day and how the sessions actually go.